Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the ASIL meeting again, um, and welcome to our panel on international law and theories of global justice. Uh, this is a panel sponsored by the International Legal Theory Interest Group, as well as the World Justice Project. I'm Steve Ratner from the University of Michigan Law School, and I'm delighted to have uh, you all watching us today, uh, along with our distinguished panelists. Um, international law and political philosophy represent two very rich disciplines for exploring issues of global justice. Um, at their core, both seek to build a better world based on some universally agreed norms, rules, and practices backed by legitimate and effective institutions. Um, international lawyers, even the most positivist of them, have some underlying assumptions about a just world order that predisposes their interpretive methods. And legal scholars have incorporated theories of justice and concepts of justice even in their work, even if their overall orientation tends to be rather pragmatic. Um, philosophers, too, have looked at questions of international law um, in different ways, as we'll discover today. But there's still a lot of mutual um, misunderstanding, even suspicion between international lawyers, both academic and practicing, and scholars of global justice. And they've engaged really more in parallel play than any kind of collaboration. This is very unfortunate for both fields, but it's particularly unfortunate for international law because the subjects of international law have been dissected and appraised by philosophers for decades or even centuries, from secession to permanent sovereignty over natural resources, from the law of war to climate change, from trade and investment to global health. Um, so today's panel um, aims to consider whether and why international lawyers, both academic and practicing, should care about philosophical theories of justice. And we hope it's a continuation of a dialogue between these two fields. To lead us through uh, this question, we have, we'll have a discussion with, with four truly interdisciplinary scholars who work on legal and philosophical questions. First, joining us from Vancouver is James Stewart, professor at the University of British Columbia Law Faculty. Um, before that, he was a real lawyer on the Appeals Council of the ICTY. Uh, he's worked at the ICRC and for the Prosecutor's Office at the ICTR as well as the appellate chamber of the Extraordinary Chambers for Cambodia. Um, he holds degrees from Wellington, Geneva, and a JSD from Columbia, and his work concentrates on corporate accountability, international criminal law, and related issues, and he has his own blog at jamesstewart.com. Um, from Seoul, we'll have Ji Woo Song of Seoul National University, um, associate professor there in the philosophy department, um, or department of political science, excuse me, um, her area, though, is in political philosophy and political theory, um, including uh, the theory of human rights and the theory of international law. She has both a PhD and a JD from Harvard um, and has written in both um, uh, and has written on international law in a number of philosophy journals, including philosophy and public affairs and the Journal of Political Philosophy. Joining us from London will be Carmen Pavel, um, a senior lecturer in international politics at King's College London. Um, Carmen specializes in political philosophy and the history of political thought, um, including international justice and international law and liberal theory. She got her PhD at Brown, but it did, and it did postdoc work at UVA and at University of Arizona with Alan Buchanan. Um, her work looks at institutionalizing rights and theories of constitutionalism. She has a forthcoming book from OUP on international law and its authority over sovereign states. And finally, from Maryland is David Luban, university professor and professor of law and philosophy at Georgetown. Um, David has also been a distinguished chair, has a distinguished chair in uh, ethics at the US Naval Academy. Um, for decades, David has been a leading theorist on moral and legal responsibility, um, including uh, in, in international law, looking at the responsibilities of governmental actors, the military law firms. Um, his specialty within international legal theory includes international criminal law, uh, just war theory, national security law as well. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, and he's written countless books and articles over the years and is on the editorial boards of a number of legal and philosophical journals. Um, so um, with those introductions, we're going to start with, uh, with James, um, then we'll move to uh, Ji Wong, then Carmen, and then David. Each will give a five to six minute overview of this issue, um, and then we'll move right to the discussion. So um, uh, James, whenever you're ready, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you so much, Stephen, to the organizers for inviting me to present uh, among this august group of scholars. I thought today that I would offer a perspective uh, as a 
practitioner of international criminal justice, this for a number of reasons. First, I cut my teeth as a practitioner, as, as Steve mentioned, a while ago, and it was really in practice that all of the questions in moral and political philosophy that I now work on posed themselves to me. I've also been thinking in that mode for a number of months again now, and it's one of uh, the things I like so much about the ASIL conference that it invites sort of uh, dialogue and symbiosis between theory and practice. There's also another reason, and I guess this is a statement of humility uh, amongst these panelists, that I suspect that I'm the least adept in both moral and political philosophy uh, among this panel presently, and likely by more than one standard deviation. So I, I wonder if the practical uh, vantage point might be useful, uh, because I do think that um, an experience of practitioners has something significant to offer to discussions about global justice, and likewise, that global justice has something important to contribute to our self-understanding uh, as practitioners. And I thought in the time that uh, is available to me for the next three or four minutes, that I would offer two stories, two examples, one from moral philosophy and one from political philosophy that I hope sort of lay the land and, and uh, help orient us uh, about this for international criminal justice and practice. And my supposition for each of these stories is that uh, global justice and philosophy as a, as a component of that enable us to be more conscious of what is fair in international law, and also that they give us a far greater self-consciousness of the place of international criminal justice within a robust theory of global justice. So let me start, uh, I guess, with the example from moral philosophy. Now, when I first began as a practitioner many moons ago, uh, there was a concept that was dominant, a legal concept that was dominant in ascribing responsibility to individuals. Uh, and, and by a legal concept, what I mean is a legal notion that was doing all of the work in allocating responsibility to individuals for atrocities that took place uh, in various parts of the world. This concept was called joint criminal enterprise, which is essentially conspiracy. I won't go too much into uh, the concept presently. Uh, and joint criminal enterprise was uh, reduced to the acronym of JCE. But there emerged a real concern, a real malaise about the potential excess of joint criminal enterprise, which was captured in the transformation of the acronym from joint criminal enterprise to just convict everyone. And this transformation had important uh, morale effects on practitioners working in international criminal justice because they felt that they were involved in something that was illiberal and excessive. But what was really crucial in this process was that it emerged that it was necessary to have some external analytical platform through which to consider just how and why joint criminal enterprise may have been excessive. What was it about it that led to this concern that it was excessive as a concept of punishment. And here, moral philosophy was, uh, and remains, I, I think, a really key, ex a key component of what would constitute an external platform from which to critique those sorts of ideas. Uh, and this is really quite a significant moment, I guess, in the intellectual history of international criminal justice because there became a, a very sudden concern about what constitutes responsibility. And those questions became all the more acute in the intricacies of descents into totalitarianism and mass violence. So what emerges in this place is the use of moral philosophy in the broader context of ideas about global justice to think through very practical questions about what is fair, what does responsibility mean, what, do institute, what role do institutions have in ascribing responsibility. The second example I, I wanted to put on the table, I guess, to, for food, as food for thought, is from political philosophy. And again here, my, my hypothesis is that uh, political philosophy also offers practitioners of international criminal justice a better orientation around what it is that they're doing, uh, and also a greater self-consciousness about the value of their work as potential contributions to a more just world. And the story that I want to tell you uh, in this instance is about how international criminal justice labeled itself for the longest time and a criticism of that labeling. So at least initially, there was 
a process whereby international criminal justice and those within it described international criminal justice as international justice to cool, that is leaving out other concepts of distributive justice. It was as if uh, corrective justice was both necessary and sufficient as a concept of global justice. Now, this was obviously impoverished as uh, a theory of, of justice and more than a little bit hubristic. And so in the years that followed, a number of important critical scholars drew on political philosophy to, to reveal this hubris in ways that were especially helpful. So Gary Simpson, for instance, speaks about the ways in which international criminal justice makes arbitrary distinctions between violence by hand and violence by political economy. Um, likewise, to draw on a theme that has animated political philosophers uh, more than international criminal justice, from uh, Peter Singer to Thomas Pogge and others, there's a critique that in many respects, global poverty kills more people each year than atrocities. And so for all of the value in memorializing atrocities through institutions like Nuremberg, there's a concern through a political critique that potentially Nuremberg is also inviting us to forget the distributive concerns about global justice that have animated political philosophy in such important ways. Now, to my mind, We're sometimes this critique it goes a little bit too far and it involves an overcorrection. It implies that uh, corrective justice is not only insufficient, but also unnecessary. Um, at any rate, I do believe that global justice provides a useful frame for this and that this frame is helpful for practitioners and, as I say, developing an orientation and self-understanding. So that's everything I really wanted to contribute. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to participate and think about these issues. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, initial thoughts. Um, Ji Wu. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I, I tell people that I work in the uh, political philosophy of international law, um, which I see as the endeavor of investigating whether norms of international law are justifiable. And in this sense, my work so far has taken um, what Steve calls in one of his papers, the, the law is target approach, that is bringing tools of philosophical inquiry to bear upon questions about whether existing or potential legal rules are normatively defensible. So this law is target approach, as I understand it, combines um, a normative interest in figuring out what a justifiable international legal order would look like um, with the tools of philosophical investigation, uh, which include at the most basic level, um, just evaluating, constructing and offering arguments that is identifying premises and conclusions, assessing the validity of the inferences from the former through to the latter, contemplating objections and counterexamples and responses uh, there are two and so forth. So I use these basic tools, for example, um, in a paper on universal uh, jurisdiction uh, where the standard justification for universal jurisdiction has long been that some violations are just so morally heinous that they warrant a permission to exercise jurisdiction regardless of ties of territory or nationality. And I began this project with the sense that universal jurisdiction was indeed normatively important and worth preserving against the significant backlash um, it had been facing since courts started using it in human rights contexts. Um, but that the standard heinousness justification had trouble adequately re rebutting the backlash. For example, um, that it had trouble explaining the um, exceptional moral gravity of piracy, um, which is the original universal jurisdiction crime after all, or explaining why exactly um, heinousness justifies an expansion in jurisdiction rather than say an increase in severity of punishment. Um, so I worked through these counter arguments um, to reach an alternative justification on which uh, universal jurisdiction is indeed defensible, but as a response, not to moral heinousness, but rather to gaps in enforcement that would very likely emerge um, unless international law were to institutionalize something like it, something like uh, universal jurisdiction. So that's one example. Um, another part of the philosophical toolkit, as it were, um, is just making distinctions. So breaking down claims 
arguments or even uh, entire narratives into components that are conceptually independent of each other. And this can sometimes come off, I'm sure, as pedantic or tedious, um, but I also uh, think that it's at least sometimes useful for making progress. Uh, so for example, uh, one topic that has recently dominated discussions about human rights um, is the question of whether international human rights law and the human rights movement um, have failed uh, adequately to respond to the problem of increasing economic inequality across the world. This kind of critique um, has uh, recently interacted with anxiety over various political events uh, to fuel suspicion that uh, human rights may no longer be useful or relevant. Um, so in a recent paper, I try to figure out the significance of this critique by parsing its various components. I argue that the critique consists of two distinct charges. Uh, first, that human rights law and the movement um, are objectionably minimalist, um, that is too modest in their normative ambitions. And second, that the human rights movement has somehow crowded out um, other more ambitious movements in ways that have been detrimental uh, to the fight against economic inequality. And I go on to argue that the charge of minimalism um, underestimates the political potential of human rights if you kind of investigate the, the uh, conceptual materials of it, um, and that the charge of crowding out is um, empirically um, under established. So the practical upshot is that international human rights um, do, do not come out to be uh, useless or irrelevant, at least not as dramatically as these recent uh, critiques uh, suggest. So I want to conclude with an observation that um, is partly sociological. As Steve mentioned, I did a JD PhD um, and upon entering law school, I expected to interact uh, a lot with legal academics or um, be academically oriented among my classmates. And I did do that, um, but I also ended up spending a lot of time working with um, and talking to a certain strand of practitioner types, um, in particular, those who were or were training to become um, human rights advocates. Um, and that happened, I suspect, um, at least partly because uh, we shared what I earlier noted was an important part of the law's target approach um, or the project, of the political philosophy of international law, um, namely an interest in figuring out how international law or the international or global legal order could be justifiable. So this interest, it seems to me, naturally brings with it an openness uh, to entertaining alternative legal rules or legal orders and more generally to, to social change. Um, so, and this connects with um, James's uh, uh, opening remarks. Um, so I think it would be a mistake to assume that inner disciplinary work uh, simply is interdisciplinary academic work or work among um, uh, legal academics and academics from other fields. And the pr practitioners, it seems to me, are also an important part of the conversation. So I'm, I'm glad that James is here. Um, and that's the last thing I want to say. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jiru, for those comments. Uh, Carmen? Thanks so much, Stephen, uh, and thank you, ASIL and the uh, World Justice Forum and the International Legal Theory Group for putting this together and for my co-panelists and those of you tuning in. Um, I started as a political philosopher being uh, deeply interested in questions of individual rights and state authority. And one of the research questions that I worked on for a while was how to limit the ability of states to commit uh, large scale abuses against their own citizens. And I started to look at international law as an area where there are possible answers to that question. And, and, and to understand the way in which international law really changes the, the relationship states have to their own citizens and to each other. And this is how international law became for me a project in itself because I wanted to understand more about what kind of a thing this, this thing was. And so I do think there are very um, uh, important opportunities for political philosophers and international legal scholars and practitioners to, to enrich and, and improve um, their, their practice and scholarship. And so I'm going to talk about two ways in which political philosophers can um, provide resources for um, the study and practice of international law. So one is um, a more conceptual sort of um, approach which helps to position international law as a practice in our social and political world. One of the things that I became interested more recently was 
some of the skeptical arguments about international law and international legal practice that seek to de delegitimize a law, both as an area of study, uh, but also as uh, an area of public policy that's worth sort of investing in by states and, and that, that gives states resources with which to uh, approach international cooperation. And so there are various skeptical attitudes, both among academics, but amongst the broader public, uh, that uh, are based on a misunderstanding about what international law does, uh, is what its accomplishments are, and the ways in which it can sort of help to create uh, rules for living together peacefully. So my recent book project uh, called Law Beyond the State seeks to delegitimize uh, these, some of these uh, skeptical critiques of international law um, and, um, and to address things uh, uh, like uh, the idea that international law is merely the expression of powerful states' interests or that it doesn't really have an effect on state behavior or it doesn't really uh, have an impact on the ways in which individual rights are protected. And so, um, so the book makes a distinctive contribution, the book that I'm working on, to understanding international law as a critical and irreplaceable sort of part of an international order characterized by, by uh, peace and justice. And it addresses two kinds of audiences. So one is this sort of audience of skeptics who seek to de delegitimize international law. And the other is actually the audience of its supporters. So both um, international legal scholars and practitioners and this is sort of the more substantive scholarly contribution because I want to uh, argue that taking international law seriously as a source of legal obligations that constrain states and define their rights and responsibilities as well as the responsibilities and rights of individuals require a more demanding uh, conception of international law. So these, this is sort of the broader conceptual contribution that political philosophers can make to the study and practice of international law. The second is uh, a, a, a more, if you want to call it practical, directly practical concern with uh, criticisms that people raise about international legal rules and institutions with respect to their justice or legitimacy. So you hear in public discourse, or in the um, uh, actions of activists and, and NGOs or of public political officials, uh, concerns about uh, the unfairness of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court or the uh, regime uh, for protecting refugees or concerns about the unfairness of rules of international economic trade. And what political philosophers do very well is to take these concerns seriously, take them apart and understand what are the ways in which they're justified. They actually capture something that's really accurate and true about the way international law functions, but they also provide an account of how to address these concerns. In other words, how to change these practices to place them better in line with um, a defensible conception of justice. Many of my colleagues engage in political philosophy, engage in this kind of scholarship. Uh, Sarah Fine and David Owen on the, with their work on immigration and refugees. Colleen Murphy works on transitional justice. Um, Catherine Liu on the legitimacy of and legacies of um, colonial rule. Daryl Mollendorf on environmental justice, um, and Annie Stilts and David Miller on the importance of sovereign states for processes of collective self-determination. These are just some of the names of scholars who could, could make, give more resources to international legal scholars who work in the specific areas um, to um, basically sort of recast the arguments they're using in their um, practice and, and for scholars who work in these areas uh, to understand the, the, the moral dimensions of these, of these debates and these discourses. So I think I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Carmen. Um, and from Maryland, uh, David. 
Hi. Um, well, thank you all. Um, my focus today is really on a topic that's uh, preoccupied me for my entire career, and that's the connection between philosophical just war theory uh, and the laws of war. Now, obviously, that is a connection that is uh, ancient. It goes back uh, to Grotius, who's both a jurist and a philosopher, and well beyond Grotius. Uh, but if I can pick a start date, for the contemporary conversation, I'd pick 1977. 1977 was the year that the first two additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions uh, were enacted, and they set out the legal framework for modern international humanitarian law, IHL, and linked them with human rights. Uh, not entirely by coincidence, 1977 was the year that Michael Walzer published Just and Unjust Wars, which is arguably the greatest treatise on just war theory since Vittel. Now, notably, Walzer declared that human rights lay at the foundation of his theory. Um, now, Michael wasn't writing in a philosophical vacuum. The 1970s was a decade uh, when rights theory dethroned the reigning utilitarianism as the dominant strand in Anglophone political philosophy. Uh, it was the decade of Rawls and Nozick and Dworkin taking rights seriously, as well as Walzer. And now all those uh, philosophers were in conversation with each other, both figuratively and literally. Now, um, I'd like to point out that there are striking overlaps between Walzer's theory and international law. To take the most striking, his version of the use ad bellum is largely identical with the framework of the UN Charter. And there are similarities in use in bellow as well. Walzer's moral argument about collateral damage to civilians requires attackers to take affirmative precautions against it. And that requirement also happens to be one of the most important legal innovations in additional protocol one. Now, I'd say that Rawlser really began a renaissance in just war theory, and not least because he was connecting it to modern human rights. When you think about it, though, human rights is a pretty improbable candidate for a theory of just war. Soldiers will remind you that their job is to kill people and break things. How can you possibly square that with the human rights project? Now, in the law, that same question or a version of it arises in a different form, and that is whether uh, human rights law, IHRL, uh, or IHL applies in armed conflicts. And it's fair to say that there is no consensus answer. Uh, the ICJ's Nuclear Weapons Advisory uh, opinion tried to split the baby. It says, well, IHRL always applies. That's very nice. But in armed conflict, IHL is the lex specialis. Now, obviously, that answer just finessed the issue rather than resolving it. Uh, and it's a, an issue that keeps arising. Just a week ago, uh, in uh, the Majid Khan case at Guantanamo, Judge Watkins found that IHRL governs non-international armed conflicts. And I want to say uh, it's a right decision. It does govern it, unless it gets reversed. Now, in philosophy, the tension between just war and human rights sprang into really vivid relief in the early 2000s with the rise of the so-called revisionist school in philosophy. Revisionism assumes a very strong theory of individual rights. Its central premise is that unless you waive your right to life by posing a tangible threat to the lives of others, it's morally impermissible to kill your use lethal force against you. Obviously, that premise is modeled on uh, the law of self-defense in domestic criminal law. The revisionist innovation was to apply the same principle in warfare. Now, the intuition here is very powerful. Uh, in or out of war, you might say, morality is morality. Rights are rights. The two warring sides can't waive my right to life because they happen to be fighting with each other. But there's no question that revisionism is jarringly at odds with the law of war. Under IHL, uniformed enemies can be targeted and killed even if they're posing no threats. Not so in revisionism. In IHL, lawful combatants on both sides have the identical rights and privileges. Not so in revisionism, where aggressors have waived their right to life, but defenders haven't. So we have to ask, 
is a doctrine so far removed from the existing law, any use to lawyers? I'd say yes and no, and I'll start with the no. Quite simply, to take revisionism totally on board would be a very big gulp, and face it, the law just does not do very big gulps. Uh, even the leading revisionist, uh, Jeff McMahon, doesn't think that the law of war should mirror revisionism, which is what he calls the deep morality of law, or, or of warfare. Uh, furthermore, within moral philosophy itself, there's been strong pushback against revisionism, and I'll call it a kind of philosophical counter-revolution, and I have very serious doubts about uh, revisionism taken neat itself. Um, on the other hand, this is crucial. It's, imp um, it's impossible to deny that focus on individual human rights have become ever more prominent in the law of war, just as revisionism says should be the case. Um, Ted Marone calls this the humanization of humanitarian law. Gabby Bloom calls it the individualization of war. Humanization, individualization, make revisionism and counter-revisionism legally relevant, and international lawyers, I think, ignore these philosophical debates at their intellectual peril. Now, happily, some of the very best philosophical writing in today's just war theory is by highly knowledgeable and trained lawyers and legal scholars who are masters both of IHL and moral philosophy. And I just want to end with a shout out to a couple of them, and that uh, um, Adil Haq's brilliant new book, Law and Morality at War, published in 2020, uh, and Yanina Dill's terrific paper on the moral division of labor between IHL and IHRL, which was also published this year. Uh, these kinds of things by legally sophisticated, philosophically sophisticated scholars um, are models of what I think that philosophy and law can bring or do to one another, for one another. So that, that's it for now. Thanks for, uh, to everyone for those initial uh, thoughts. It's super helpful. Um, we have, um, judging by the clock, uh, a, a nice amount of time for discussion uh, between 25 and 30 minutes, I guess. Um, so um, I, I'd like to throw some questions out to uh, the four of you and uh, get your sort of initial reactions. Um, in, um, in some of the initial comments, we got began to get a sense from all the four of you about sort of how uh, philosophers' way of thinking about international issues differs from the international lawyer. Uh, Ji Wu gave some specific examples of how her thinking about universal jurisdiction might differ from the way a lawyer thinks about it. And James, you gave the example about how philosophical uh, philosophers began to make you think not so much about the doctrine of JCE, but um, in terms of its internal coherence, but just whether it really went too far as a whole. Um, and so I'd like to sort of invite, I'd like to invite the four of you to think of, to just, uh, if you can, for a few minutes each, um, um, give, give our, our audience a sense about the sort of methodological uh, rigor that the philosopher offers compared to what the lawyer offers. The lawyer always thinks that she or he is rigorous and thinking about what distinctions make a difference. And that sounds like you know logical thinking. But what is that extra added value that the philosopher offers um, to, to, the, to these uh, debates that we've been talking about specifically? And you can uh, either just start talking or you can signal me in the chat if you'd like to go first. Uh, Carmen, yeah, or raise your hand, that's fine. Thanks so much. So maybe I can um, just uh, bring up one of the ways, one of the obstacles to actually interdisciplinary dialogue, um, because some of the obstacles are quite serious. And so one of the ways in which um, maybe international legal scholars and practitioners might have difficulty engaging with political philosophy is because political philosophers sort of by training and professional deformity think about ideals of justice a lot and sort of think about how uh, the current um, reality differs from that. And so uh, so my sense is that for some uh, legal theorists, not for all, this is a, a sort of a, it's very easy to, um, uh, when they encounter political and moral philosophy, to perceive it as utopian, that political philosophers make proposals, 
that are unfeasible, unrealistic, maybe even those that disrupt the health and operation of international law if taken too seriously. And so I want to address this kind of sort of worry that international lawyers have um, and, and, uh, and maybe, maybe to some extent put it to rest. Um, it's important to, to sort of understand that all of our institutions, and that includes the institutions and rules of international law, got where they are through change. Uh, someone at some point had to imagine new rules, new, new institutions, and to create, create blueprints for reform. And so what moral and political philosophy can offer is precisely guidance with respect to those blueprints for reform. Change can be better or worse for those who are subject to authority. Uh, the status quo can be defensible or indefensible. So political philosophy gives tools and a methodology to evaluate change from the standpoint of justice. So I just encourage sort of those uh, who are sort of disposed to regard the work in political philosophy um, as an exercise in utopianism to, uh, to really have more patience with that kind of methodology because it will be surprisingly rewarding and enriching. Um, others on that, David? Yeah, yeah. Um, let me mention a couple of ways in which uh, I think from the legal point of view, um, political philosophy and moral philosophy will be surprising. And you know, whether this is uh, something that is a disadvantage or not, I don't think is, is to the point. Um, one is that uh, philosophers will feel a need to push an inquiry maybe a step further than lawyers think it's necessary to push it. So to take for an example, um, the notion of human dignity, which appears in innumerable legal documents and judicial opinions. Uh, you know, I think it's an open secret that nobody really knows exactly what human dignity is. Philosophers will think that that is a question that needs to be investigated, um, even if the answer to it doesn't actually have any practical implication in what the law is, although it might actually have a practical implication because some concepts of human dignity might rule out some legal, <clears throat> excuse me, legal implications. So that um, <clears throat> pushing an inquiry to uh, a level that lawyers uh, often don't feel impelled to push it to, I think is one difference. Uh, a second is that we all understand that legal rules often are um, the result of political compromises uh, and are therefore imperfect in the eyes of everybody on all sides of the compromise that looked at them. And uh, we say, well, look, that's, that's what compromise is. That's the best we can get. And uh, a philosophical argument, I think, um, doesn't, um, you know, doesn't want to or particularly need to compromise. Um, so that raises questions, of course, about the art of the possible, but that's always uh, a question about any kind of academic work. Um, you know, legal scholarship, as well as philosophical scholarship. And I think the third I'll mention is that um, uh, the formulation of legal doctrine, there's always concerns about uh, administrability, uh, uh, about uh, Simplicity, is this a doctrine that um, jurists who you know, aren't necessarily geniuses can, can use? Uh, we want simple rules for the simple world, the way that Richard Epstein put it. Uh, and that's not so much a concern for philosophy. And so you know, philosophical discussions of justice issues oftentimes don't put the same kind of weight on administrability and simplicity that I think uh, legal doctrine does and uh, that lawyers are comfortable with. Hi, uh, James. Yeah. So, so I thought maybe I, I would uh, give a, a, a brief illustration also. One of the great uh, gifts it, it transpires about working uh, as an investigator on atrocities in Rwanda as a very young man uh, was that it presented a set of really acute moral problems. And one of those that really resonated with me for the longest period was about the responsibility of those selling weapons to notoriously brutal regimes. 
Uh, and there was a, a core philosophical problem in that dynamic that really had no attention in international criminal justice scholarship. And that is just basic questions about causation. Is it meaningful to say that someone who sells a weapon to a genocidal regime shares responsibility for the outcome with which that transpires as a consequence of that sale? And that moral problem is really a deep and, and uh, lasting philosophical problem in the theory of causation. So part of the theory following people like Hart and Honoré is that no, the actions of the perpetrator who used the weapon are an interrupt the causal chain and therefore only the perpetrator becomes responsible for the, the final outcome. And so it was really engaging with these sorts of questions that I, that I uh, came to work like J.L. Mackey's Cement of the Universe, an 800 page uh, volume on the theory of causation. But I confess what I think is significant and what I guess I'm trying to suggest about this relationship between theory and practice is I would never have made it through that time without a practical question to solve. And I never would have made it through that time without thinking that philosophers had thought far more deeply about these sorts of questions in ways that might shed light on a, on a real practical problem. Um, so I think there is in that uh, something about the relationship between philosophy and practice that I think is salient. Chima? Yeah, it just, um, this follows up, I think, on some of the things that were said, but um, I thought it was apt that you framed the question as um, comparing the philosopher's rigor um, with the lawyer's rigor, because I think it's, it really is two different kinds of rigor. So the philosopher is naturally inclined to start from premises and then just follow the argument. And often the premises will reach back to fairly basic uh, principles. Um, the lawyer's job um, often involves, I think, at least two uh, characteristics that at a superficial level might seem puzzling to the philosopher. One is that uh, the lawyer will uh, be confined or will, will uh, try to work within the confines of current positive law um, and try to ensure that every step they take um, involves an identifiable and plausible step that can be traced to some bit of the current positive law. And then the second, perhaps more um, interesting thing is that um, the lawyer, um, as just as a function of their role responsibility, will often start out with a conclusion that they need to establish, right? Which is very different from the just follow the argument approach. So for instance, um, the lawyer um, who uh, figured out that perhaps he could use the alien tort statute to get a court in New York to exercise jurisdiction over things that happened among Paraguayans in Paraguay um, had that conclusion uh, in mind uh, when they started the investigation. Whereas the philosopher's question more naturally seems to be well, should a court in New York exercise jurisdiction over events of the sort, right? Um, but I think it's not so much a matter of um, which is the superior kind of way of thinking. It seems like different contexts call for different kinds of rigor. Um, and it seems like the same person would be able to employ both kinds of rigor depending on the context. Thank you, Th those, are, those are great perspectives and, and all uh, really good examples. Um, and, and I guess, you know, in a number of your answers, you sort of, to both my prior question and the initial uh, round, you, uh, you, a number of you mentioned specific philosophers whose work uh, you think lawyers might find a particular use. I guess I'd be interested if, if each of you could say a, a little bit more about whether there are uh, certain strands of philosophical work that um, are particularly useful, what, what, what do they have in common? Um, and, or maybe certain strands that are not, is it, is it simplistic to say that sort of ideal abstract theory is gonna, you know, is a, a lawyer is gonna, you know, her eyes are gonna glaze over and it's just not gonna be that helpful? Or is there something about these ideal theory foundational pieces that is of use? What is your sense when you look at the philosophical literature um, today as to what, um, what is uh, useful for the lawyer's role. We'll talk a little bit more about what the lawyer's role is, but um, if, if you have a sense of philosophers or philosophical approaches that are particularly accessible to the lawyer, international lawyer, both practitioner and academic. So can I? Yeah, Carmen? 
<laughs> go again. So because I really liked um, some of the examples that are given. So James is an example of starting with a really practical question and how that sort of motivated his study of, of certain philosophical questions. So I think if international legal scholars and practitioners want to uh, find out more in philosophy, I think they will typically start with a sort of a more a specific question about maybe a particular area of, of international law um, or a specific question related to sort of certain sort of conceptions of rights and responsibilities in international law. Um, and I think what you, what they might typically t tend to find is that that will lead them to further questions in philosophy um, and sort of deeper and deeper. So I do think sort of on the first level, what's going to be the most useful is the type of political and moral philosophy that does deal with more concrete, specific sort of areas of international law and issues of justice in those particular areas of international law or institutions. But I do want to sort of plead with those that have the patience and interest to say that even types of philosophical theorizing that may seem like they're more idealized, more utopian, will pay off um, because they will open up broader questions about uh, the structure and the role of international law as a whole and about the role of the legal practitioner in it whether you know whether uh, that uh, whether the practices and institutions of international law actually make people's life better off or worse is a really important practical question but in order to answer that question, one would have to go maybe into quite abstract and abstruse philosophical questions about the role of institutions and the role of law in, in regulating uh, our, our lives. So I do think there's a role for very ideal types of theorizing and imagining possibilities for institutional change and reform. And even if the end result is that we reject those very ideal utopian kinds of theorizing, what that will give us is a better appreciation of the features of our world of international law and institutions that we actually like and we want to keep. Um, and so maybe new ways, new resources for defending them uh, against those who seek to challenge and change them. Great. Uh, yeah, let me uh, ask the same of uh, the other of uh, the other uh, three of you, and, and maybe you can fold into your your response the, the point that the issue that Carmen just addressed, which is in a sense as you think about what kind of philosophy is um, sort of most useful. I don't want to put it quite that narrowly, but of most interest to international lawyers. What does that say about what it means to be an international lawyer? Because we have people who are tuning in who may be, you know very, uh, you know, arbitration and their goal is to win the case for the client and their, or, or they have a certain, uh, you know, a certain professional identity that may, for which global justice questions may seem at odds. So as you, as you think about sort of what philosophy is most accessible, maybe you can offer your views about what that, what that philosophy, what that says about the role of the, of the lawyer. Um, who'd like to take a shot at, at that? Uh, yeah, Ji Woo? Yeah, I just, um, I guess one very simple answer is just to echo on something that David said earlier is that um, there are all these uh, people working in both philosophy and law who are just truly bilingual. <laughs> Those people, uh, their work, I, I imagine, would be kind of straightforwardly useful uh, for a lot of lawyers. Um, but also, I think, um, and this goes to your second question about how the lawyer is to understand uh, their identity. Um, I think it would uh, just with just going to going back to the example of human rights advocates. The the people that I think are the most competent and the people who I admire are people who seem genuinely open to um, critical investigations about what they're doing, even the kind of most basic commitments. Um, so again, to to pick up on another example that David mentioned, um, the kind of people who would say pick up. Um, Charles Bites's recent article on human dignity that seems highly suspicious about whether there's any uh, meaningful, helpful content there, um, rather than thinking, oh, but we can't really engage with that. That's sort of you know, blasphemous, right? Um, so I think that kind of open-mindedness, um, if the lawyer, as, as, insofar as the lawyer can understand their identity in this vein, um, critical investigations by philosophers and political philosophers would be useful. Um, 
in this way. Uh, James? So if I can, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to uh, break my answer down into two parts. The first is very specific suggestions of, of philosophers that I find interesting, and I think international criminal justice will also. And then the, the second is to pick up on the question about idealized utopian visions of philosophy and how that plays out for practitioners. So I'm gonna be very brief with the first round. I think that the philosophical literature on emotion is fascinating and, and deeply underappreciated in international criminal justice, and Nussbaum being the most prominent. Uh, I think uh, Richard Rorty's work on human rights is exceptionally interesting for practitioners, precisely because practitioners tend to be pragmatic in different ways, and I'll come back to that in the second segment. Jonathan Glover, I think, is very important. He has a piece called um, It Doesn't Matter Whether I Do It or Not, which I think should be haunting for international criminal justice. And uh, the entire literature on human rights and global poverty, I think, is really quite crucial, precisely because of the ways that it it sets international criminal justice in the context of a broader vision of global justice that international criminal justice has done uh, too little to address, I think. The second part that I, where I wanted to pick up on idealized uh, and utopian visions of philosophy it is to bring to the table something I think that, that's very germane, uh, and that is that the practitioner has to decide. And that is really a, a burden on a practitioner that I think in, in large part philosophers and academics don't enjoy. It's, it's more than sufficient and often very helpful to say, well, the answer to the solution is between X and Y. Ah, this is an interesting dialectic, who knows? Um, but the practitioner in practical context actually has to make a decision and knowing that that decision is fallible. And what's significant about that obligation to decide is that it mimics the responsibility of those that the prosecutor or the judge is actually judging. Uh, so I think that's a, an added burden on a, uh, a practitioner that's really quite significant. And that to the extent that uh, academic discourse and philosophy can play a bearing, that bearing is to orient the decision. So I, I don't know. David? Yeah, um, if, uh, a few, you know, a, a few, more or less scattered thoughts. One of them is this. I mean, if the question is, uh, for example, what can an advocate uh, writing a brief or making a case for a client take from philosophy? Um, the answer is going to be disappointing. Uh, what they're going to take is going to be sound bites and memes, because obviously writing a brief is not a place to make a full-fledged philosophical argument. What they might take from a, a background in philosophy is uh, um, a, a sense of uh, what the larger contours of an argument are. And if they're trying to write a brief that's embedding the argument uh, in a claim of fairness, then uh, a philosophical orientation might be useful. Now, what's useful to read, I think, uh, um, is, you know, this is a very crude answer, the, the really well-written really well written work of which there are very different styles in philosophy. Walzer's book, which I mentioned earlier, is subtitled A Moral Argument with Historical, uh, uh, historical Illustrations. And the argument is built up from real world case studies. Um, other books in the just war literature that I admire greatly, like uh, David Roden's book, um, War and Self-Defense, or Jeff McMahon's book, Killing and War, don't do that. Um, uh, there, I mean, it's what, uh, what makes them work is a kind of uh, spareness and purity of argument and a you know, tremendous logical sense about how things fit together. Um, but you know, they're also... Um, zeroing in on something substantive. I think what, what is not useful uh, for practitioners would be a kind of uh, um, academic literature that is more on the epicycles and scholars talking to other scholars about what third scholars have said, not because it isn't important, but because it's not entirely, I mean, you, you just have to get in too far to see what the issues are. But the, the last thing I'd say is uh, something that's always struck me from a, um, what's arguably the most influential article in, law, in American Law Review's history, and that's Oliver Wendell Holmes' Path of the Law. Um, and uh, Holmes ends by saying, you know, by making a plea for the, the importance of ideas for lawyers. And uh, he says something like, you know, I've known many corporate counsel with large incomes 
And uh, I can tell you that the real satisfactions of, of being a lawyer don't come from that. What they come from is the fact that law gives you an insight into things that are larger than the law. And uh, he ends with uh, almost mystical language about uh, seeing how the world's uh, uh, how how the world's infinite processes work. And uh, um, that's, I think, uh, you know, a very Socratic and Platonic notion about why philosophy is useful to lawyers. You know, Socrates says, uh, uh, the question is, uh, how are you going to live your life? And uh, uh, that kind of orientation is something that I think moral philosophy and political philosophy can really have to offer. Yeah, I, and I, I mean, this is, um, of course, uh, a core question that participants at an ASIO meeting ask themselves, and uh, we hope those who are who tuned into this panel um, uh, think about those questions and what their role is and, and how you can actually have multiple roles. And I think as David pointed out, when you're writing a brief for a client in front of a court, you, you may be in a very different role than when you're a legal advisor to a NGO or the UN or um, a mission at a UN meeting um, when you're in a prescriptive process. And so the, the different roles for uh, and, and or defending international law against skeptics in front of a congressional committee. Um, there's all different roles that international lawyers can play. Um, well, alas, um, because of the constraints of this uh, uh, online forum, um, we have run out of time. Um, I would just like to thank um, the four uh, panelists for uh, joining us from their different uh, time zones at different locations. Uh, there is a rich body, to those of you out in viewing land, there is a rich body of literature. Please don't hesitate to contact any of us if there's some good articles you want, want us to refer to you uh, that we can help to get you started on this path. We hope this is the beginning of a conversation among political scientists, philosophers, and international lawyers about, about global justice questions. And we look forward to, to many more opportunities to discuss these uh, across our disciplines. So thanks everybody for joining us. Pleasure, thank you.